Welcome to One Plus One. I'm Kurt Fernley. Harry Garside is the ballet dancing plumber who boxed his way to Commonwealth and Olympic glory. We'll catch up to talk about Australia's first Olympic boxing medal in 33 years. But to Harry, there is so much more. Garside, welcome to One Plus One. Mate, thank you so much for having me on. Mate, where is this Olympic bronze medal? Where's it, where's it kept? <laughs> <laughs> it's currently in Melbourne, so I'm uh, living in Sydney at the moment and I left it with my mum because I didn't want it to go missing. Knowing me, I'd, pro pro <laughs> I'd probably misplace it somewhere. <laughs> I, I, my first two medals actually stayed with my mum and dad for nearly 20 years. <laughs> you know, is, is it sometimes that that medal, that symbol, actually means more to the people around you than it does yourself? To be honest, like, 100%. Like, it's it's just a medal. Like, the physical thing doesn't mean much. It was like, everything that went into it that means everything to me. So, and the person that i become chasing that medal, that's probably what is more important to me. And I'm going to give away that medal just like I gave away the Commonwealth Games medal. Like, it doesn't really, the physical thing doesn't mean too much. It's everything else that goes on. You gave you gave away your Commonwealth Games medal? <laughs> yeah, I gave it to my coach. Oh, did you? Yeah, yeah, so I gave it to my coach. And I'm probably going to give the bronze medal, the Olympic bronze medal, to the city council, where they want to put up in a museum or something like that. And I think, fingers crossed, uh, it inspire maybe a young person or something like that. Um, you know, obviously Australia's not the best at boxing. We haven't won a medal in a long time. And if a young person saw that, then... Hopefully, it might encourage them to do some, especially combat sport, which would be great. How do you reflect on that moment then? That moment where you would win the bronze medal at Tokyo? It's been an interesting sort of few months uh, trying to like, like debrief it in my brain. And it's, I'm proud of myself, don't get me wrong. Of course, it was a failure. I think as athletes, we have to have that mindset. If it's not a gold, if it's not the top, then we can do better, we can do more, we can train harder, we can be better. And, Bronze medal wasn't what I went there for. I went there for the gold. And as I mentioned, I am proud of myself in the sense of how I handled myself in the ring, how I handled myself throughout my preparation and never turned my back on myself. I mean, I'm proud of myself for that. But the result itself, I've got more to give. The medal itself, so you're, you're going to give it away to the, the local council or it's going to go somewhere. But that's also the first medal that <laughs> Australia's won in 33 years. So the, the symbol of that, you're not tempted to kind of just you know, tuck that one away for yourself? <laughs> no one, if I probably kept it in my house, my brothers might steal it and probably try, <laughs> try to trade it in cash convert or something like that. Um, but yeah, as I said, the physical, of course it's special, but um, I've got some other great memorabilia from the actual Olympics. The medal itself, I think it would be amazing to put it in, like, as I said, the city council or something like that. You grew up in Lilydale in the outer, outer Melbourne, a youngest of three boys. How do you describe your childhood? Uh, yeah, youngest of three boys. Childhood was really good. It was, I was always active, uh, very grateful in the sense of my parents always allowed me to play as much sport as I could. Play basketball, football, uh, cricket, uh, soccer. I played so much growing up and, and my brothers were really blokey and really manly, the stereotypical males and, and always at the back playing in dirt or playing with power tools and, and I was always inside with my mum. Like I was a lot closer to my mum's energy and, and I think because of that I didn't get much respect from my two older brothers um, and I think that's probably half the reason I started boxing. My brothers were always fighting with each other, always beating me up every now and then, always fighting on the football field and, and I was never doing any of that. And, and I think because of that, I didn't get much respect from them and, and, and as well my, my dad, which is like, he never once said it, of course, but I just felt that. And I think when we feel that when as a young person, it's like, I don't know, you, feel, you don't feel like, I didn't feel like a stereotypical male, so I wanted to try and impress them. So if you were staying inside with mum while the brothers were outside throwing dirt at each other, did you get that moment where you fit in with them? 
Uh, I think there was a period. So when I entered school, obviously being the youngest, I felt like there was a bit of a role pushed on me to play. So my brothers were a bit rough around the edges and, and always playing up at school. And when I got to school, I felt like there was a bit of a role pushed on me by, by teachers. They're like, oh, you're a gar side. But even by my friends or my brother's friends and stuff like that, I almost felt like there was a bit of a role pushed on me. So when I was in primary school and especially the first few years of high school, I played this role where I almost was my brothers. I mirrored them and, and whatever I saw them do at home or whatever my dad would say at home, I would go to school and say that. And it almost, like looking back at my life now, it like, it like ate me alive. Like I felt uncomfortable with my whole, I felt a bit like, like tight and restricted because I wasn't being my true self. And throughout the last few years of high school, I slowly but surely started to understand myself more. I was able to like delve into myself and love myself for the good, the bad and the ugly. And, and it's okay to, to be, be in love with boxing, but also love like performance arts and dancing. And, and like, that's okay. It's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's the best thing about being human is how unique and special and different we all are. And that's what makes like this earth so special, I think. When you're, when you're young, you're dealing with so many, like I think everyone's dealing with so many insecurities. What sort of insecurities were you dealing with? I think probably the biggest one was just my manhood getting questioned a lot. Um, yeah, like even my dad said when I was young, and he didn't say this in a disrespectful way or in any way, shape or form, he just said, I was preparing for you to come out of the closet when he said this to me when I was 16. I was preparing my whole life for you to come out of the closet. And, and like, as I said, he didn't say that in a disrespectful manner or in any way, shape or form to like try and hurt me or, or something like that. But it's just like, I just felt different. But because I just wanted to feel like fit in, I sort of sacrificed myself and I almost amplified how manly I was to sort of fit in, but like I knew it wasn't me. How important is that in sport to understand those insecurities and potentially even harness, harness those insecurities? Oh, of course, it's so, so important. I think what I realised, I actually said this to someone recently, what I realised at the Olympics, and I'm, I have more insecurities than anyone, um, and I noticed at the Olympics, I just felt like there was a whole bunch of small, small people at the Olympics, like small young people that didn't have their love or needs met. You know what I mean? I just felt like there was a lot of people just like, like they were looking for attention or they were looking for this external validation or looking for a medal potentially just to fit that thing that that young person didn't get. And I felt that and I felt that personally, but I also felt that when I was in the Australian headquarters, walking around the Olympic Village. Um, and it's interesting, I think, Understanding your insecurities and being, as you say, being able to harness them is so important for any high performance environment. I'll always love Dan Kowalski, he's one of my favourite athletes, a swimmer uh, for the Australian Dolphins. And he always said that the difference between an Olympic and Paralympic athlete and everybody else is that they are the person that will never let go of their tiny little teddy bear as a kid. There's this belief that you carry around that you can be the best in the world when you're five, six, seven, eight, nine. You hold that for so long. And if there's not a better representation of insecurity than this teddy bear, then I don't know what is. But when you harness that and you can turn it into a real strength, then that's where I see these jetpacks, these, these guys that are utilising their insecurities to perform and to put every part of their life into it. When did you feel like you harnessed yours? At what point were you like, that's behind me or that's something that I could utilise? Yeah, it's a good question. I think it's an ongoing process. I'm slowly but surely understanding myself a lot more. But like growing up, my oldest brother, um, he's battling with mental health problems and, and drug addiction in and out of prison and and me and him personality wise have such similar personality traits and and I think the biggest thing that separates us is I was able to talk about and harness my insecurities where he felt he couldn't really talk about them um, and so he's trapped him in a lot more and it's heartbreaking to see that to be honest but I think for me the ability to be able to talk about them understand them if they're trapped up here, I think you make up stories in your head and stuff like that. When I talk them out for me, I'm able to understand them more. It doesn't mean anything that I say could be wrong, could be right. 
It's just when I say it, I can understand it better and we can have like a back and forth conversation, understanding my insecurities. And I think it's so important for us to understand us as humans because realistically it's the longest relationship we have <laughs> in this world is the relationship with ourselves. And a lot of people, I think relationship is pretty poor. Um, so I definitely just want to like make sure my relationship with self is, is, is very powerful, strong, and I'm never turning my back on myself. I know how much your entire kind of family is important in your preparation when you're giving, you know, so much of your life towards going to an Olympic or Paralympic Games, you give so much. How important is that family support? Oh, it's huge. I think I was so fortunate growing up, my parents never once pushed me to go to the boxing gym. It was always on my back and, and my parents just supported me. Like, they never tried to coach me, they never tried to push me into doing something I didn't want to do. They just supported whatever I wanted to do and I'm so grateful for that. And and throughout the whole journey, your family are the people who are closest to you. And it's sometimes I treat them pretty piss poor. You know, before a comp, you're, you're losing weight, you're depleted, you're, you're, you're anxious, you're nervous, you're scared, you're fearful that you're not gonna get the result you want, you're putting a lot of time and energy. So sometimes those feelings can be pushed onto your family members and, and for them to like still be there no matter what and, and love you unconditionally, I think is really special and, and to like, for me, sharing the Commonwealth Games when they were there, Gold Coast, running into them like my parents, that was like a really special moment. And I'm just so blessed that I've got two parents who, my dad is a roof tiler, he's a tradesman and, and hard working Aussie bloke. And my mum's a medium and she talks to dead people. It's really spiritual. So there's a great mix in the sense of, I was, they, they complement each other really well. And, and I was able to see like, there's no real one way that's the right way. Every way is fine. And, and, and I love that. How does an individual's addiction kind of land in a family unit? What's the, the effect of that? It's huge, to be honest. And, and, and I'm, an, I'm an addict myself. I'm, I'm addicted, to, addicted to sport, mate. I'm, a, I'm grateful that, that addiction for me has been harnessed in a really positive way and, and in a way that I've grown and developed myself and, and I'm addicted to this sport. I love the sport of boxing, but... In another sense, my brother is, is really genuinely struggling and, and, and I've personally, I've gone through so many ebbs and flows. I'm the youngest and at times I felt like I was his older brother. I mean, at times I felt like I was the one who had to be the support for him, support network for him. And, and there was times where I hated him. There's times where I really wanted to hurt him. There's times that he'd hurt me. There's times that he'd hurt my family. And, um, at the point I'm at now though, um, it's taken me a long time to get here. This has been an ongoing journey. Like, I just wanted to know like, that I love him and, and I message him every now and then. I don't get many replies, but I message him every now and then and just like, I'm always here no matter what. You know, I mean, family, blood's always blood and, and you know, gold medals, bronze medals, <laughs> results in sport. Like, at the end of the day, all you've got is your family and all you've got is the people around you who support you. And, um, yeah, he just doesn't feel like he's got that around him and I just want him to know that he's always got his family. When it comes to those period of time where you're, you're reaching out to other sports, you said your mum and dad put you through everything, why did you choose boxing? <laughs> yeah, so my parents never once pushed me to go to boxing. So when I first started, as I said, my manhood was getting questioned a little bit when I was younger and... And I started because you watched too many Rocky films. <laughs> yeah. I watched Rocky films. I didn't start boxing. <laughs> Great movies. But I think Classics. I just remember the whole family just getting connected to those movies and, and everyone's like watching, especially the fourth one, uh, USA versus Russia and Ivan Drago versus Rocky Balboa. What a movie. Mate, running through the running through the snow dragon a tree trunk. Doesn't <laughs> get better. Than oh good, honestly. <laughs> I'm so good. Uh, but moments like that, I just remember the whole family getting connected and and yeah, I initially just like, I told my parents, and I remember my mum like had absolute shock and horror on her face. Like, why do you want to start boxing? Like, can't you go back to play basketball or something like that? <laughs> but yeah, I think once I got there, like a kid who I personally lacked a bit of self-confidence because I didn't feel like my brothers and stuff like that. Like having a coach, once I entered the gym at Lourdes, I coached Brian Levere, who's still my coach today. Like he fed me with so much love and positivity. Like, you're, oh, your footwork's so good. You're so naturally gifted. Um, he says this to every kid now that I've realized. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he said that to me and I felt special, which I think is so important. And, and I think because of that, and of course I love the art of the sport, but 
the element of my coach lifting me up and feeding me with so much love and positivity. I mean, I wanted to keep going. I wanted to keep like impressing him and impressing myself, impressing my family. And, and slowly but surely, I just fell in love with the sport. And it's like meditation, mate. It's, it's the most peaceful place. And we're often told as humans, especially in this day and age, that violence isn't the answer. And, and, I, and I totally agree. But I think it's like the most natural thing that we can do as humans is, is fight or, or survive. And when you're in that ring, it feels like you're, you're just trying to survive and you're just, you're just fighting your way out of things. And like, I just, I think it's like the most natural place we can be. You're a little um, unconventional when it comes to prepping for a, uh, for a match. Tell me about how ballet fits into your prep. Yeah, so I've done numerous different things to, to prepare for any tournament. And uh, ballet for me is personally my favorite fighter who I've got tattooed on my leg, Vasily Lomachenko. Um, he did traditional Ukraine dancing and um, he was massive. And I even know Arnold Schwarzenegger did ballet. James Hurd, who's a famous AFL footy player, did, did ballet. And I just knew how special dance was gonna complement Juju Vasily Lomachenko and so in 2019 I built up the courage and always wanted to dance, never really wanted to tell like my dad I wanted to dance or my brother or anything like that but I always wanted to try it out and finally I built up the courage to try it out and I fell in love with that as well mate. The movement is so fluid and strict and like you can't turn your back to the bar, can't have chewing gum on, can't have your watch on, there's so many rules and structure and I really like that and it really complements boxing as well and and if it adds 1% to my boxing, then that's great. At that level of high performance, 1%, half a percent is good. So if, if you can really, and I really have noticed a difference in, since starting it. And yeah, I'd encourage anyone to try any dance for, for sport. What about the painted nails? Before a match, we'll see you at a press conference and the nails are painted. What's, what's the story behind that? By painting the nails, the initial thing when I was 16 was just to challenge stereotypes. Like, it's okay. Like there's, you're not going to lose your hand if you paint your nails or there's no real stigma. It's only the stigma that you place on it. Um, and I think for me, the reason why I did it at the Olympics and before fights is just trying to showcase to young people especially, you don't have to fit this mould that society, your friends, your family um, pushes on you. You don't have to fit the stereotypical male or, or female. You can be whatever you want to be as long as it feels right to you. And I just want everyone to like try something different, try something new, because I definitely didn't think a young boy who was scared, timid, growing up was gonna start boxing and fall in love with it. And it's because I bit that bullet and, and I tried something that was out of my comfort zone and I fell in love with it. And, and look, the places it's taken me, the, the person I am now because of that. And I just really want to encourage young people to do that as well. We're here, we've got the boxing ring behind us. Like, when you're about to go into comp, you're about to go through those ropes. What's going through your mind? <laughs> um, a million different things. Um, I know before the Olympics, so I hadn't fought in 18 months prior to the Olympics due to COVID and um, the feelings before that first match, it was like some of the thoughts were going through my head. I'm, I'm going to get humiliated. I'm going to get knocked out. The guy was a massive puncher, a really strong, powerful man. And I'm going to get humiliated. I'm going to get knocked out. I'm gonna lose 15 years chasing this dream, it's gonna end like that. These are some of the thoughts that were going through my head. And it was quite amazing that, like personally, I was able to sit in that and be okay with it, but it's pretty full on the feelings that go on before a fight. I don't know if it's the same for you before Man, a race. I was, I was terrified. Yeah. I was terrified before every race. Yeah. Nauseous, nervous. Yeah. Is it, have you thought about why, in a sense? Because it meant something to yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Every single time that I was about to go out and roll, it, it meant, it meant something. So the nerves, the anxieties, the fears, the but also it was it was I think the campaign and the trick is about it's about utilizing them. It's about grabbing hold of them and actually making them productive. And yeah, it, it you know, understanding that over a period of time and then refining the ability to make them productive that was just crucial. Yeah. And, but most people don't see those fears, <laughs> you know, how do you, how do you get past them? There's numerous things. I think the biggest thing is, so I've felt this four times in my life where I've fully prepared for something. So the first time I did this, where I was fully prepared, never turned my back on myself, dedicated myself to my craft throughout my preparation. The first one was my first nationals that I won. And that feeling where I could look myself in the mirror before the event was amazing. The second time was the Commonwealth Games. The third time was the Olympics and the fourth time was my first professional fight. 
You know what I mean? And all these times where I was able to like look myself in the mirror before the event because I prepared properly, you know, I was able to look myself in the mirror and go like, I've done everything I possibly could. And whatever happens now is left up to the boxing gods or, or like it's left up to the universe, whatever happens. And that feeling of never turning my back on myself and makes the nerves relax. Doesn't mean they're not there. Of course, they're still there. But I think for me, that feeling before, I always bang my chest three times. I've been told by someone that apparently it resets your fight or flight. No idea if it's true <laughs> or not. But I think it works for me. Mate, I wore the same undies for 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a fight. Superstition here. I love it. I love it. Yeah, so bang my chest three times and as well, a bit of breath. I think but breath is like the, the best thing we can do as humans. It's the thing that's always consistent. And just taking a couple of deep conscious breaths into my belly and just knowing like it's gonna be fine and back myself in that moment. And it's a really like powerful moment of like, you're scared, fearful, confident, proud. Excited. Excited. There's so many things that go on before an event and, and it makes you feel the most alive, that's for sure. Do you get nervous about the long-term consequences of the sport? It's definitely something that I've said to my partner, if you start noticing my, my words slurring or, or something like that, make sure you tell me because I want to make sure I'm successful outside of boxing, but I'm keeping my brain really active. I get MRI scans yearly, just making sure everything's all good. I want to make sure this is just a sport and, and, I, and I love the sport, so I don't ever want it to take away from my ability to think or be or live. Was there an alternate path for you that wasn't boxing? <laughs> I always wanted to be the next Michael Jordan. <laughs> but unfortunately, I'm not even six foot. <laughs> I was going to say, oh, you're about as likely for me to be Michael Jordan. <laughs> um, yeah. You tried five times. This was your fifth time to, uh, to try and get to an Olympic Games, whether that's Junior Olympics or Olympics across Rio and Tokyo. What did it feel like when you got that call to say that you've, you've made it to the Olympics? Like, oh, <laughs> adrenaline pumps in my body when you talk about it. Um, it's amazing. I think any young person, before I even started boxing when I was seven, watching Grant Hackett, you know, swim the 1500 meter final 2004, and like that moment, like that was the moment that the birth really started for me and chasing that for over 15 years and then to finally get the opportunity to, to put on the green and gold. And, and the feeling of like walking in the village and, and looking down at my chest and seeing the Australian emblem with the Olympic rings, like words will never articulate what that meant to me. And um, there was that feeling of fulfillment, pride, even just like that feeling of chasing something for so long and, and sometimes giving up things, friendships, relationships. Um, you're not living the life of a normal young person. You know, everyone's going out in the 18, 19 drinking. I wasn't doing any of that. I was really focused on trying to achieve things and. And to finally get the opportunity, it was, it was really electric. And, and if I could bottle that up and drink it, just a little sip of that, <laughs> it would be amazing. But um, yeah, just to get there, I just knew. I only, boxers maybe get one or two chances and I knew I'm not gonna let this chance slip and I was gonna make sure I try, try my best and, and that's what I did. Where were you when you found out? So I was on the border of uh, a place called Eden on the border of New South Wales and Victoria. And, Victoria was going into a lockdown due to COVID and I couldn't risk not being able to train. So I had to drive, packed my bag and just drove straight up to the border and um, was there waiting patiently for Daniel Andrews to make a decision if they were extending the lockdown or not. And thankfully they didn't um, extend and, and I was able, I found out when I was there and then I was able to drive home and, and talk to my family and, and hug them and celebrate with them. Were you working as a plumber then? Yeah, I was at the time and, and I've always had the philosophy, if it works for boxing, it works for me. And, and growing up, I was always, once I left school, I knew I had to find a job that enabled me to box. Obviously, when you're at school, you have, you're not really stressing about too much and I knew that. So when I, was, when I left school, I found a job with my brother as a, as a plumber and it gave me the flexibility where I could wake up in the morning, train before work, sometimes lift weights during, during work. He would let, allow me to go and then box after work. He'd always make sure I was there on time, which I'm so grateful for. And um, I'm grateful I'm not on the shovel as we speak. <laughs> He'd always get me doing the worst jobs, but <laughs> um, I guess that's him being a big brother. <laughs> How much do you have to give to make it to that stage? How much do you sacrifice to become an Olympic medalist? I think you have to sacrifice heaps. And you're not living a normal life. And sometimes, you mean, I get a bit of FOMO, you mean, fear of missing out. And, and of course, we all get that. And, and like, that's understandable. But I just know 
when I do that, when I do drink or when I do be a normal, like live a more normal life or I don't enjoy it. Like I only enjoy when I'm chasing greatness in boxing or whatever venture it is for me, but it's for boxing. And, and when I'm pushing my limits in that, in that world and, and really trying my hardest, that's when I find out the most about myself. And, and I don't really get that inspired when I'm doing the other stuff, to be honest. So you have to make these choices, but I want to make these choices because I know the person that I've become. But still, I've even been I've been in races overseas where you get there and you're missing out on a birthday party and you are like, oh, <laughs> and it's so funny because that life seems so like bold and shiny, but sometimes there is this desire and this missing the, the normal moments as well. Yeah, the reality is I think if we could do both, oh, it'd be we great. would and we could be just as successful and, and go to parties, great, I would do that. But we also know that it's not possible and um, you gotta do what you gotta do. and. and Someone also fed me this analogy, like we wear this mask often as humans and maybe I wear that mask when I go out and party with my friends or something like that. But when you take that mask off and you show who you really are and what you really want to do, you attract people who accept you for, for the real you. And when I'm chasing that, that Olympic glory or the boxing greatness, I'm attracting people who will support me in that. And, you know, I've got a partner now who's fantastic and she really supports me in that and, and she's got her own thing and she, she's helping me chase my thing while I'm also complimenting her while chasing her thing. And you just attract people who accept you for you and what you want to do and, and that's what I've noticed throughout the journey. How was your prep for Tokyo? It was a pretty complicated period <laughs> of time. Yeah, it was a bloody long period. Um, so we went in camp, it was about a 20 week prep. Um, so I left Melbourne at the start of March 2020, 2021, sorry. And um, yeah, it was away until after the Olympics. So got back in the start of September. And um, it was a long prep, but we were fortunate enough to, to be based on the Gold Coast, beautiful place on the Gold Coast, training really hard as a team. And then we went to America and we spent three weeks in America, high altitude training at the Olympic Training Centre. And then we went to Japan early. So very grateful that Boxing Australia enabled us that opportunity. And I felt so prepared. I couldn't throw my left hand throughout that preparation, which was starting to get to me a little bit. But the last three, four weeks, I had a quarter zone shot. The last three, four weeks of the prep, I was able to throw it inspiring. And, and, and I felt like because of that, because I couldn't, couldn't use one hand, I was making sure I was doing everything else. Like all the one percenters, going to bed early, waking up every morning, meditating, visualizing, saying things in the mirror. I was doing so many things outside of the ring because I knew I couldn't use my left hand, so I had to do extras. What were you saying in the mirror? I'm an Olympic gold medalist. I'm enough. I'm worthy of love. I'm powerful. I'm strong and I'd repeat it so many times. <laughs> How important is that, that mindset? Because everyone's doing, everyone's disciplined, right? Like everyone's doing this incredible amount of work. How important is the belief behind that? It's so important and I think there was elements, of course, that sometimes you're even saying things and, and deep down maybe you don't fully believe it, but the more you say it, the on more repeat. you, yeah, on repeat and you kind of change the tone with yourself and, and it's, for me, that last fight that I lost against Andy Cruz Gomez, who is an absolute superstar of boxing, and I knew it was going to be a really hard fight. I lost that fight before I even got in the ring. It's because I didn't have the belief there, which is heartbreaking to say out loud. But, like, I think having a belief as an athlete and as a human, just belief in yourself and, and loving for yourself and, and being kind to yourself. As I said, one of my things is I'm lovable. I'm worthy of love. I'm enough. These are things that I felt growing up that I lacked. And I think just constantly saying positive things to yourself, you just reinforce that you are, you've got your own back and, and, and you can get through anything as long as you keep reinforcing you, you are strong, you are enough, you are powerful. You've just turned professional, what does that mean? Yeah, so professional is, you're more so representing yourself. Yeah, so um, in professionals you're representing yourself rather than in the amateurs you're representing your country. Um, so I've done the Commonwealth Games, done the Olympics and, and for now any boxers goal is to then turn professional and try and win world titles for our country and all the fighters I've got tatted all over my leg all but one have been to the Olympics and done really well for their country and then they turn professional and, and try and win world titles so that's the goal now and um, just focusing on that and, and I've still said to my manager I want the door to be open for 2024 Olympics because we can do both now. Why is that so important to you? Got unfinished business. I think, yeah, so that's probably the most important thing. The Commonwealth Games doesn't fuss me too much. You I mean, I, have, I put that to bed, I'm happy with that. I'm happy with that result. The Olympics, I've got unfinished business. Australia has never won an Olympic gold medal for boxing and I want to be the first. 
Well, I, I do hope to see you there. And uh, thanks for joining me on One Plus One. Thanks for having me on, mate.